What's up, everybody? Uh, this is RB3. I'm Sabrina. Uh, I'm Ben. And Ben Goddard joins the show today. And we are, uh, this is the Meaning of Podcast, a podcast where we talk about your favorite filmmakers and the deeper meanings in, within their films. And today we are talking about not necessarily a filmmaker. We haven't talked about a filmmaker in a while. But this is, uh, <laughs> this is more of a genre we're talking about today. And uh, the genre we're kind of talking about, per uh, Sabrina's suggestion, is uh, art house horror, elevated horror films, the evolution of of the horror genre. Um, so Sabrina, talk to us about what what, what brings you uh, to this topic today? Yeah, so I've always kind of loved the horror genre in general, and then especially within the past few years, seeing the way, this sounds really bad. Yeah, yeah. Like this, really bad? Yeah, is yeah. that that's, okay. that's just what we're working with, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, I can like barely hear myself. Okay. I could turn you off. <clears throat> Maybe try that. Oh, okay. That sounds a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, you, so don't, okay. you don't sound terrible. And my mine sounds a little tinny, but when it's, really, it's yeah. I think it yeah, maybe sound sounds like worse to ourselves. Yeah, I think so. Because mine was really, really bad just right now. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> we'll cut that out. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've always been a fan of like the horror genre in general, and then over the past kind of like decade, especially within the last like six years, I kind of noticed um, the way filmmakers are taking horror to another level. People like Ari Aster, people like Jordan Peele. Um, I just feel like they're kind of like refreshing take on horrors, keeping it new, keeping it exciting, starting a new brand of horror. So I'm going to bring it to Ben. Hey. Yeah. What is your Thank idea you of, me. of course, so yeah. excited, have of a little course. SCN live reunion. Yeah. 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 Subscribe yeah. to yeah. First Cut. Yeah. 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 I'm proud to say that. Finally here. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but what do you think of as like elevated horror and what are some of your favorite examples? That's what I look for in horror movies because I'm not a big horror person and like what was it? It was the Blair Witch sequel slash basically soft reboot. Yeah. And where like four times in a row they when you know they're already deep within it. Are we allowed to cuss on this show? Of course. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we encourage it. They're they're already like knee deep in the shit. Like yeah. the, yeah. the 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 spooking <laughs> has begun and they're walking along and someone will go hey real loud and scare everybody. And they do it like four times. And then finally someone turns to the camera because it's found footage. And they go, hey, stop doing that. I'm like, just because you call it out doesn't mean you didn't have four cheap jump scares. And I just, I'm not a fan of jump scares. And so movies like The Thing or The Descent or Cabin in the Woods that rely on knowledge and suspense and building these things up and building paranoia and just disbelief of the unknown. Like, that's what I love. And like you said, like, Hereditary. I didn't see Hereditary for a while. Or The Witch. Like, I finally caught them last year, and I love them both because I saw Hereditary after Midsommar, and yes, I say Samar because I'm so fancy. No, I yeah. do the same. So okay. uh, I, don't know what it's, I still don't know what it's called to this day. So it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think he said Samar, so I was like, all right. If it's Samar. a movie, it's Midsummer. One. If it's a film, it's uh, Midsummer. Yeah. Yeah. This is yeah. elevated Samar. horror, yes, guys. Elevated. Yeah. So. Art house, you know. <laughs> mm, yeah, specialty theaters. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And movies that, like Green Room, like yeah. uh, I feel like A24 really specializes in this kind of stuff that, it may be not fit directly into the peg of horror, but it it brings in those horror elements. Yeah. Like Green Room is almost like an escape room without that bad movie Escape Room that came yeah. out last year. <laughs> but it just brings in these horror elements, like just this dread and this just heavy mood that it puts you in. And that's what I love about it. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, no. Um yeah, I'm not. I, I'm growing up. I wasn't the biggest like horror movie fan just because the movies that, you know, were kind of coming out around the time that I was growing up were like kind of lower in quality. Uh, just you know, for lack of better terms. Uh, yeah. But like, yeah, you, you know, grew up with like Saw and like all the the torture porn stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I yeah. still like those. No, I, I love. Gonna, I actually love Saw. Yeah. You know, like Saw is probably one of the better ones. But uh, yeah. I love all the <laughs> shitty, even like the Halloween uh, remake. The yeah. Rock oh, one. I still like was, those. Those yeah. have a special place in my heart. Like I don't like it nearly as much. I remember I rewatched it for like oh, an for episode. the new one. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah. So I I can recognize that it's not good, but at the time that's you know there, that there's was my, a lot to be s- thing. There's definitely a lot to be said about that category because of like just the kind of catharsis of it, especially yeah. like in Hostel when at the very end like he gets back at everybody and like yeah. runs them over and like chops off their head and stuff and so yeah. there's something but yeah, after a while it was just like creating different ways to torture people i'm just like this yeah this it, was, so it was really yeah. in the convoluted story like yeah. I, I couldn't it was, it was it. over reliance on like gore and like yeah and all yeah. that stuff yeah some of them were disgusting the one that, the one that <laughs> the one that really like stuck out in my mind was um 
was the hub was the hobo it wasn't it wasn't necessarily hobo a with a movie. shotgun yeah hobo with a oh shotgun yeah that God. movie was visceral man. yeah that movie is like ah i can't even watch that movie to this day <laughs> that was like uh, one of my first like when i first got netflix that was on there yeah. and i was like what is this yeah, and then yeah. like he literally turned some guy into a pile of goop with it like as <laughs> yeah. a hammer i was like what is yeah. what is happening yeah it's too much I, there's one part where like a lady was getting like her her legs like sawed off or whatever. Oh, I think God. her like stomach or whatever, yeah. and then they had to go to the hospital. Yeah, it was too much. Yeah, um, but <laughs> over over recent years, the horror genre definitely like changed uh, significantly, um, just through like the introduction of production companies like A two four, like Blumhouse. Who in the beginning, you know, we talked about it a little bit before we started, but like they probably had about five or six years of just making terrible movies. Like yeah, but but once they finally, it was terrible, but it was reinventing the formula of how horror movies could get made. To where yeah. we could elevate to a point to where um, we could start getting high quality films on like a low quality budget or, or low low word budget. Well, yeah, because even something like The Invisible Man that's coming out um, like next week, uh, it was made on an eight million dollar budget. Seven. Seven million dollar yeah. budget. Yeah. That is insane. And it, I, I can't talk about it yet because the embargo hasn't lifted by the time this comes on. But it really is so cool to see because I know it's going to turn a huge profit. I'm, yeah. I'm looking at like the Blumhouse like production list, and they did Paranormal Activity. You know how much money that that exactly. movie cost? Yeah. Fifteen thousand yeah. dollars. You know how much it made? Yeah. Two hundred million. Yeah. Like yeah. that, Holy like, wow. and that, and that's what I feel like Blumhouse, you know, they're the, they're the Tyler Perry of, of horror movies. They make cheap <laughs> stuff and they'll, and they'll make back their money opening weekend, yeah. good or bad. Like, yeah. and, but I really feel like this, this goes, just goes back to A24 yeah. because they're really pushing the boundaries of what horror is, what you classify as horror. Like Midsummer is the perfect example because people were expecting kind of hereditary 2.0 or just something more horrific. And there are a lot of horrific images in that movie mm -hmm. and some gory things, but there's no jump scares. There is just like kind of building tension. And does it ever get really released? Like besides the bear suit thing, like not really. Yeah. Like there's no real big scares, but would you qualify Midsummer as a horror movie? Um, I would. Yeah, I, I would just because I feel it's more disturbing. Uh, but yeah, I, you know that's 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 interesting because they do kind of blur the lines of like, mm -hmm. what are these movies pre mm -hmm. exactly? Is it a horror movie? Is it a thriller? Is it really just a drama? Yeah. Or what's you know? I think I think the way the thing that makes it elevated horror to me is the way it deals with horrific themes, mm -hmm. with like mental illness, grief, all of that. The way it kind of spins it, where it's not it's not like a drama. It's clearly like taking it to a much more sinister level. Um, so that's why I love what Ari Aster does with his two A24 films, obviously with Hereditary and Midsommar. Um, dealing with those themes that run through both of those films, even though they're so different, but they have those similar things weaved throughout. It's just something I admire so much of his. Like He's one of my favorite filmmakers right now. Yeah. yeah. There, yeah. There's no, and uh, we'll, we'll get around to it, but I'll I'll jump into to The Witch with Robert Eggers and just, I... Anya Taylor Joy is one of my favorite actors working today, and I think I saw her first in uh, Split, and just Same. like her her work in that movie. Then I then I came back around and eventually saw The Witch this year, and just there. And I I just love how just terrifying that movie is because they're just there, and like the, somehow they're sitting there to make their their place in like this open field, but it's so claustrophobic. It's so just terrifying in this colonial era, mm -hmm. and like. How they speak is like so foreign to us now, but I love how that gets ratcheted up. And I think uh, just because you think the movie's gonna be like, oh, is there a witch? Is there paranoid? It's like, no, there's a witch, and she's doing some terrible shit out there, and you need to deal with it. And yeah. uh, it's amazing. I love it. Yeah, no, um, yeah, the witch is probably one of my favorites of the of the recent recent time period because it, it addresses a lot of themes. Um, Outside of just being like a psychological horror movie, outside of just being a supernatural horror movie, it addresses a lot of themes of like America, Americana and like um, religion and like all these different um, myths that like persisted throughout history and how it just kind of communicates that through uh, through the both the tone and the atmosphere that like Robert Eggers uh, presents. It, it just makes it like a really unique and special like experience. So. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's actually interesting to talk about did you think The Lighthouse, because I know uh, RB3 hasn't seen it, but, like, I consider that horror. I do, too. Okay. Yeah. Because we, we had, obviously, when we were talking about Midsommar, I definitely consider The Lighthouse um, 
So like Robert Eggers, like he is killing it both with the witch How? and with the lighthouse. That deserves so many more <laughs> nominations. Like you know, I know the the big one is obviously uh, Tony Collette and Hereditary. We, yeah, that's been talked about for years. Uh, since it came out, and you know she got snubbed, absolutely. Yeah. But I feel like both Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson got snubbed, Definitely. and I was telling people if you are doubting Robert Pattinson as Batman, mm -hmm. you need to see The Lighthouse because yeah. you will not doubt him anymore. Because I mean, if you've seen Good Time, if you've seen Cosmopolis, like he's proven himself over the years, but people still are referring to Twilight, and yeah. I mean, in a, in essence, that's fair because it's just like his big movie, that's his blockbuster, and he hasn't done one since. But it's been so long. It has. And he was so young. Him and Kristen Stewart both, I feel like at this point, have already proven themselves enough. Yeah. Um, I can't say anything about Kristen Stewart anymore because they'll kill me. <laughs> kill me. They kill me on SC about Kristen Stewart. Hey, I, I don't disagree with you about Kristen Stewart, but it's just it's just unfortunate <laughs> that every time she pops up to do a bigger movie, they're bad. Like yeah. I, I didn't see Underwater, but I didn't hear great things. But Charlie's Angels was rough. I didn't see that one. Yeah, yeah, kind of, kind of skipped out on both. Yeah, of those. she yeah. she has a new uh, film <laughs> called uh, C C uh, Seaburn or whatever. Yeah, yeah, about like the French uh, actress during the 1960s. Yeah, I, I listened to her interview with uh, Shia LaBeouf, the actors on actors thing, and they yeah. were talking about that, yeah. and he loved it. So I mean, yeah, after that's the, a funny the, combination. That dude, I I had to I had to watch <laughs> yeah, it. Exactly. Like that's just <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, but no, but I don't know if you keep up with the Independent Film Spirit Awards at all. I mean, I, I saw that Laura Dern clip, but I didn't see who yeah. won. Or I, I saw the Safdie Brothers speech, which was, that was good my favorite part of that it show. Was so good. Oh. Adam Sandler's speech was amazing. I, I talked about a few weeks ago how that one kind of aligns with my taste every year a little mm -hmm. bit more than, like, the Oscars do. And Willem Dafoe did win for The Lighthouse. Oh, good. He won okay. supporting. So that's that's something that I think is really cool because he gave an insane performance even when we were doing our own version of like the Oscars when we were doing the Cuddy Awards. Mm -hmm. um, neither Ace nor RB3 had seen The Lighthouse, and I was like, we have to put Willem Dafoe on this list. Like you guys oh, yeah. don't understand yeah. how insane it is, and it is one of I don't even know how he did this and how Robert Eggers pulled this off. It is the most like fat shit like bananas. Like I had no idea what was happening. Like yeah mermaid vagina like <laughs> all that kind of stuff it is haunting imagery yeah. and and it totally works like at the end all that weirdness like it just it pays off so well it does so i i, I completely completely loved it yeah yeah i'm looking at you know like uh, i know you guys haven't seen the black coat's daughter but i feel like that'd be right up both of your alleys if you like hereditary if you like yeah. other witch. yeah the witch and stuff like that that's a24 it comes at night I, and the thing is about a24 is that they they market these movies. They need to change their trailers because I feel like they market their movies as kind of straight line horror movies or just like straight line. This is going to be A, B and C. And they never are. That's why, uh, you know, the Green Knight trailer just came out mm. and everyone's really excited about it. And I, I tweeted out. I was like, you know what, guys, I'm super excited. But remember, this is a 24. You yeah. guys didn't like It Comes at Night. You didn't like Green Room. You didn't like Hereditary. They're not going to do a Game of Thrones. There's going to yeah. be a twist. There's going to be like a tweak in the genre. So just be ready for that because that's what A24 does. No, that's a that's a really good point because even Hereditary got a D plus cinema score. Yeah. Because the people going into it see the trailer and the trailer is so different. I remember seeing Hereditary for the first time. And obviously, spoiler for anybody who hasn't seen it yet, but um, like the daughter, you think she's going to be like the the like bad person in the film and then literally like what 30 minutes in she's just oh no like i literally said that to my yeah. roommate because he'd seen it before and i was like oh man is this a creepy kid movie i don't want to watch that and he yeah good on him he was just like just didn't say anything and then you know 10 minutes later whoop yeah exactly and it's so crazy and i remember seeing it in theaters and just being like completely surprised and then for the rest of the film i had no idea where we were going because the trailer was so different from where we were actually seeing um so I feel like it's that type of thing. Casual movie going audiences, if you go out to see a film, you're you're like enticed by the trailers. So that's what you're expecting. So then when you go to see it and it's something different, a lot of them kind of have like a more sour taste in their mouths. Like yeah. which yeah. so that makes it's, sense. It's tougher to communicate uh, existential horror to people. Yeah. It's tough to communicate that in like trailers and stuff like that. And that's why I love movies like Hereditary and The Witch and even like the Baba Duke, because it's not necessarily <coughs> A horror movie, and uh, not necessarily a horror movie that's built on the conventions of like mm -hmm. being a horror kind of story. It's more scary in the fact that like you can actually imagine yourself like in these situations. It feels realistic. It feels like that nightmare that like you always have in the back of your like mind, like yeah. the entire time. Yeah, so no, definitely. That's why it's so unsettling to me. Well, there's that that infamous story of a lady going to see uh, Drive and her. 
I don't know if she, I think she just like demanded her money back. She was expecting the transporter, Fast and the Furious, and yeah. Drive is the A24 movies of, of, of heist movies because yeah. it's ve- it's Nicholas Winning Ref and it's very contemplative. It's very slow. It's deliberate. It's not Fast and Furious. It's not the transporter where, you know, he's he's oiled up and drop kicking guys like yeah. 10 at a time. Yeah. And that's where, that's where they kind of like, I don't know, production companies need to find that like fine line between showing too much in a trailer and then also like completely diverting your expectations, yeah. like giving you a different sense of what the film is. Um, but what you were talking about with the themes of the horror movies that you've been seeing, mm. kind of the way um, they are grounded by those, like you saying you could experience in real life because mm. we all have experienced some kind of grief, some kind of trauma, some type of thing. So seeing it played out in that way in Hereditary and Midsommar, it makes it more real world for us, even though um, my grandma's not a part of a pagan cult. Like, mm. it's, sure? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I'm like, I actually, you know what? Let me check up on that. Yeah. But it's one of those things where we all experience this type of this type of thing. So that's what really grounds it, and that's something I wish I could talk about. Invisible Man. Sad about it. I'll I'll talk about it next week. But it would have been perfect for this episode. Um, but next, I kind of wanted to get into like Jordan Peele with okay. Get Out and Us and kind of the impact he's had on cinema, on like elevated horror, all of that. So I don't know if you want to start yeah, off. I mean, no, obviously, uh, Jordan Pill, I'm a big fan of. Uh, yeah. Before he was doing horror movies, just do Camp Hill and everything. Um, but the the idea of like making, he what, what Jordan Pill does is a little different than like Ari Aster and um, Robert Eggers is that they're kind of looking to more like break um break uh you know tradition and break things what what Jordan Pill does he essentially takes a traditional horror kind of story but reappropriates it into making it uh more of his political or um racial perspective represented yeah. in it so like you'll see a movie like get out which is a traditional like Steffer's right wife or you know a traditional like yeah, twilight zone, twilight zone kind of story but he makes it elevated through um the social commentary that he's putting into it same with us you know us is kind of there's, we've seen plenty of like duplicate type of movies that like you know are about people being chased by their who seem like themselves um but he retakes that and makes it about class and um and dynamics and the upper class versus the lower class and stuff like that so that's what i think i find interesting about him the most is that his movies are about modern politics and modern um modern representations of like uh you know what's going on in the world so no, I agree, and it's it's this with Get Out. Uh, I have my issues about us. Like, I think the performances are great, but I think him trying to explain away the doppelgangers, like he gets a little too wrapped up in that. With like, mm. and just like him showing like their mirror, like when people are like on the roller coaster above, people are like on the, the roller coaster underneath. I'm like, don't show me this because then I just like think of uh, across the nation or people do like if I get on the highway, is someone like sprinting underneath the ground like at yeah. sixty miles an hour. But the social commentary is still there about lower class and how they're treated and, you know, oh, um, Lupita Nyong'o above ground, like, oh, she has a child and then this other baby underground was, like, ripped out of her. Like, I right. love that. And then yeah. Get Out, he took the hardest direction possible with that social commentary because he could have made it, you know, a bunch of Confederate flag-waving people, like, oh, yeah, you're going to date my daughter? No way. But, yeah. no, like, he made it, oh, I would have vo- voted for Obama for a third term and, and yeah. just, like, yeah. Stuff that you hear every day of people trying trying too hard. Mm-hmm. And I, I love that about it, especially because they, they truly felt like they weren't doing anything wrong. They truly felt like they were helping these yeah. like black people yeah. by taking away their minds. And I, I, I've watched Get Out at least 30 times because like the yeah. more you watch that movie and this, the Easter eggs are so there. And I need to do that with us because I've only seen it, I think, one and a half times yeah. because it just didn't get me the way Get Out did. And I, it's hard when a director has a 10 out of 10 movie, I think – no matter how much you love us, I just don't know if it could live up to Get Out. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I don't. Do you like us or Get Out more? I don't. Um, so I think probably for uh, historical purposes, Get Out is obviously like the bigger deal because mm-hmm. you know it won the Oscar for best screenplay, and <clears throat> that's also what you know Jordan Pill brought to the elevated horror genre too. He kind of broke that mode of getting uh, an Oscar movie. Uh, a horror movie into the Oscars. Definitely. He's one of the few filmmakers that actually managed to do that. Um, but um, I I think on a importance level, Get Out's probably a bigger deal. I think I personally like Us a little more because okay. it's like as a, as a piece of like movie and like cinema because I feel like it's a little bigger. I feel like there's a lot more going on. I gave Christian gave me that book of like the Us like I got yeah. one of these days. It has like all the little 
props and production design and it has like little sentences that like describe what it all kind of means like still kind of cryptically but it 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 shows like how many exactly how many pieces like hundreds of pieces in this movie were all kind of targeted towards the same overall game yeah. thing. so that's why i appreciate about it most like the attention to detail yeah and mike's like this bigger overall um, kind of thing yeah so. no jordan peele's definitely a super meticulous director he puts all these like tiny easter eggs it yeah. is insane because he is such a huge fan of horror which i didn't know when i was a fan of him on key and peel yeah um but it's really cool to find that out and for him to kind of take the genre um that he wasn't professionally familiar with like hadn't really worked in it before and kind of i mean coming out with get out like he came out swinging yeah like, well, right away and, well you know that's funny because comedy and horror are kind of similar in the same way that those are pieces of film that have to evoke emotion from somebody. Yeah. Right? Like it's hard to make somebody laugh. It's hard to make somebody feel scared. So I think if, you know, because he has such a home root and like comedy and he knows how to like arouse ev ev uh, emotions and reactions from people, I think he took yeah. that and applied it to his horror movies and made it that that's what makes him so great. So no, definitely. Especially yeah. because, you know, you see when people do get jump scared, like, oh, oh and they, they, yeah. they let out that laugh because it's like this just rush of adrenaline and yeah. you don't know how to express it. Right, right, right. And that's another thing that I think is the difference between something like Hereditary or like one of the other kind of like, um, I don't know, other horror films we're getting these days where Hereditary, I felt so suffocated, so claustrophobic, and I didn't feel like especially for the third act, I didn't think there was a lot of like jump scares necessarily. It's not jump scares just to like make us jump and then be like, oh my God. But it's like, it, I felt like the theater was like closing in on me and it was basically empty. I saw it at like 2 p.m. on a random day um, right when it had come out. Um, but it was one of those things. So I don't know. Yeah. Well, I was, oh, yeah. I was going to say, I, you know, before I, I mean, cut you off, but no, you're good. I was going to say, you know, for me, what I think is probably most prophetic about like Ari Aster's films is his movies are about like personal trauma and about like grief and about like all these super personal things. Whereas Jordan Pill is more about like social commentaries in general. So it's much more about the larger world. Ari Aster's films are more like personal. Yeah. And I'd even argue that Robert Eggers' films are more about the external world, world as well. I'd, mm -hmm. I'd argue it's probably more about, like, the mythology that the world presents, yeah. especially through, like, The Witch and through The Lighthouse. Um, but, yeah. No, no, you're absolutely, like, I, I I love hearing about it. Like, it's, it's it definitely, Ari Aster is definitely more of, like, a personal catharsis movie for both of them. Like, mm -hmm. that dinner scene, well, what you were saying about, I wanted to talk about the jump scares, is that it's not, you know, a loud noise bang, but when Alex Wolf is sitting in bed and it's just this shot and then you're like, there's a reason they're holding on this for two minutes. Yeah. And then, like, the screen, like, your eyes yeah. slowly adjust oh and you God. see something in the corner. Yeah. And, you're, and that will make you jump when you see it, but it's not a jump scare. Like, it's not, you know, someone yelling, hey, or, like, a loud not bang. Like, a yeah. like, I mean, I, I liked um, It Chapter One a lot, mm -hmm. but the more I watch it, the more I realize how much musical, like, music cues are behind every single jump scare. Yeah. Like, if Pennywise was just screaming at me, Bill Skarsgård is amazing in that movie. I don't need, the uh, like, a Christopher Nolan, Hans Zimmer, blah, behind yeah. the scare. Like, just let it scare me. No. And that's what that's what I loved about Hereditary is that it's not a it's not a jump scare, but it will make you jump. And that's where I feel like a quiet place might sneak into this mm -hmm. because of the use of sound, because it's it's a jump scare at heart, but it's earned because every little sound like, you know, when the when the deaf daughter's like doing this by her ear and you're like, is that snap too loud? Like you're that. And I've ne and ironically, that was the quietest I've ever heard a movie theater. I was so nervous about going to that movie, but everyone yeah. was like so holding their breath throughout <laughs> it. Yeah, I love that the trailers are basically just like shut the fuck up. Like, yeah, that's what exactly. Every <laughs> said, like STFU. So I love that. Yeah. Um, before we had to break, I just kind of wanted to bring up um, like the future of elevated horror, where you think this is going, and also about Academy or awards recognition in general with this genre because. You know, earlier we talked about snubs, Tony Collette, um, Hereditary. I would even say Florence Pugh, Midsommar. Yeah, I know Lupita, if Andres was Lupita here. Lupita Nyong'o. Uh, yeah. yeah, Lupita. Yeah, um, I yeah just, Ace would be totally mad about that. Yeah, exactly. Song, He'd yeah. be here ranting about it for a second. So yeah. that's for you, Ace. Um, and then also um, even Willem Dafoe for The Lighthouse. Oh, yeah. 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 So what do you guys, do you guys think in years to come there will be more of this like recognition for this genre? Because I feel like the films are up to caliber. I just don't think the themes align with Academy. Like mm -hmm. Lighthouse is is too strange. It's it too. Is weird. I mean, like I'm looking at this Under the Skin, Enemy, uh, Green Room, The Killing of a Sacred Deer, like The Witch, Hereditary. These are 
beautiful movies. They are beautiful. They have amazing scripts. They have cinematography. They have the performances. They have the scores. But it's not your typical drama. It's not Manchester by the Sea. It's yeah. not Green Book. For And for some reason, like, it doesn't fit into... It's a, a square peg of a movie going into a round hole of the Academy. And yeah. I don't know when that's going to end. It might get the the screenplay nomination or the cinematography for The Lighthouse, even though it deserved, like... Kick out Tarantino. Kick out. Yeah. Kick out Joker. I can't. Todd Phillips. Todd Phillips. Like Todd Phillips, yeah. uh, both Safety Brothers and Robert Eggers deserve it more. And Ari Aster. Yeah. Yeah. Like <laughs> and and but it's it's like these old it's these old ways that it's gonna take a while. And I mean I feel like it's they're slowly slowly getting it. But yeah, the performances and just everything like these movies like the I'm just looking at like the top ten a twenty four movies and all of these could be best picture. Honestly. Right, right, right. right. And I, I feel like the Oscars, you know, they only really like the horror movies that are uh, that are kind of more mainstream leaning and less horror leaning. Like mm-hmm. they love Jaws. They love uh, Silence of the Lambs. They love Get Out because it's a little more rooted. Six Sense. Like, Six Sense. It's a yeah. little more rooted in real life per se. I mean, not to say they aren't like there aren't supernatural elements in those films, but mm-hmm. there's uh, – you know, I, I guess it has a little more of a, re, a relatability yeah. factor to them. Um, so, but movies like Miss Summer, I don't know. They don't. They probably find no relation to, right? They probably yeah. look at a movie like The Lighthouse and they're like, I can't, I can't vibe with this. Like, yeah. which yeah. is to me, it's funny because even just watching the trailers of The Lighthouse, it does look like a super old school kind of movie that like will fit in perfectly if it came out like the '60s or something. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Yeah. Uh, but they don't want to appreciate it now, which is weird. So, yeah, it's it's interesting. I you know. I feel like as the Academy starts to, you know, I hate to say it, like age out, you know, we start yeah. to see more of the older people dwindle and the, and the younger people uh, get more advice and start rising up. I think we're going to see a lot more appreciation for these uh, more off-kilter genres. So. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Uh, yeah, so we'll head to break. Uh, when we get back, we'll talk a little bit more about some directors that we kind of love, highlight some more films. So stick around. This ain't funny, so don't you dare laugh With the 450 divide you in half You getting at me equals a club half You do the math Take you out the equation The following clip is from the first annual Cuddy Awards Available on First Cut Enjoy So we I'm have to moving. pick one out of those? No, we get to pick two uh, so Sorsha, we, Florence, Aquafina We put Aquafina Florence and Aquafina you guys and are taking out Sorsha Ronan. I didn't see Little Women, man. I don't know. You yeah. say Sorsha Ronan over Aquafina since we've both seen both. Yeah, we've both seen Little Women, yeah. Uh, you don't have... Well, see, I didn't finish show, I didn't even finish The Farewell, so like that's not even fair for me to say Aquafina yeah. over, over Sorsha okay, too, so, so I can't even... So some of us got to fight right now. Yeah, yeah. This some is, of this us got to fight. This is going to be a what fight. <laughs> we got to fight. No, you got to fight. No, you got to fit for his puke, man. Oh, yo, I'm not taking out Florence puke. I can I say Flo- I say Florence Pugh and sort oh my god that's so hard I really do love them all because Aquafina all these three were on my original list yeah so that's what's making it difficult mm, yeah and that's where I might take out <laughs> Renee for Judy Renee for Judy no 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 I we think can't. I might we, but she's god. literally gonna win like she's gonna I win know, the actual Oscar but like right? no I'm I'm cool I'm cool we with we, we have to rep Judy I mean this is this is like this is you think Joaquin Here's Phoenix had thing. it tough? Like, this is a tough performance. Sir yeah. Sir Ronan's yeah. And Judy's an all kind, all-time Okay, icon. fine. She's I will. I will. We always have to she's knock nominated Aquafina. every year. I'll do it. I'll yeah. do it. I'll say, fine, Florence Pugh and Aquafina. Okay. Because right, we'll I do, I love Aquafina. all three. So. <laughs> I mean, we could do so. I mean, we could do so. So, officially, our nominees are... Lupita Nyong'o for Us, Scarlett Johansson, Marriage Story, Renee Zellweger for Judy, Florence Pugh for Midsommar, and Aquafina for The Farewell. Perfect. Yeah. Those yeah. are great nominations. Yeah. Come along, children. Now we're going to have a little music. Welcome back uh, to the Meeting Up Podcast. Uh, we are still here talking about our house horror. And um, yeah, we, we, we brushed a lot of subjects so far. A24, um, you know, uh, The Lighthouse, uh, Ari Aster and Jordan Peele and all of these uh, filmmakers, uh, Robert Eggers. Um, yeah, I so feel like people, people who have kind of like a short filmography so far, but kind of like a really impactful one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Those three are some of the, I mean, because they each have like two movies, even like Jennifer Kent. With the Babadook and the Nightingale, like I, I don't know if she has like I'm not too familiar with her filmography, but like the smaller filmographies that they do have, they I think they're incredibly impactful, and that's Most why definitely. I'm looking forward to everything that they have to do in the future 
like Jordan Peele at this point for me can do anything. And I'm just like, sure. Mm -hmm. Ari Aster, same. I'm like, yeah it, yeah, it feels like these guys are truly making in the in the way that you'd go see a Spielberg film or you go see a Hitchcock film. Like you you want to see the next Ari Aster film. You want to see the next Jordan Peele film. And I mean, maybe not as big, but I am going to see the next Robert Eggers film. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, it's that age, especially now, it's like, oh, would you see so-and-so small director direct, direct an MCU movie? It would never happen, but I'd love to see, like I know, you know, Scott Derrickson left uh, Doctor Strange. Put mm -hmm. Ari Aster in that thing and let him let him just, like, take <laughs> a big swing at that. Yeah. I'd, yeah. I'd love it. If they let him direct the, the action scenes, for sure. If they let him direct the action scenes. Oh yeah, uh, like if yeah. they actually uh, that's the thing, like if they actually let him direct it, if they yeah. actually let these guys like put their vision on screen, I'd love to see a Robert Eggers Doctor Strange because that would be crazy. That would yeah. be so insane, especially like after the lighthouse. Some of the like imagery and the way his like camera work with it, it's so so good. So I would want to see what he would do with like something that's like a huge property. That would yeah. be super interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, like speaking of big properties though, um. Andy Muschietti taking on It and It Chapter 2. I feel like that's one of my, I don't even want to call it like elevated horror, but it's kind of like, you know, like the bigger um, production companies. It's a huge property. He's taking on a lot with this, and I I love both films. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what you're I, I like the first. I like the it. first one a lot. I hate yeah. the second one, but I made that pretty clear on this podcast yeah. before. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, I don't know what he was doing with the second one the first <laughs> one where, you know i talked good. about like the the jump scares a little too much on rewatch but the chemistry with the kids is so great bill skarsgård is so great the story like you know it's it's very succinct it, it's like he didn't need to make the first one after he made yeah. the second one because it was like oh uh do you remember uh, the adults well we're gonna show you all the time between the kids and when they literally go get their totems is like little kid finds totem scare Adult finds totem scare yeah, six so times yeah. in a row without a fail. Little, definitely a little too much. Like, oh, now I know why this movie <laughs> is three hours long. But Doctor Doctor Sleep could be that same thing, like you know, a big blockbuster horror True, that yeah. didn't do the money that it did because of you know probably just title like from exactly. marketing, which definitely. is such a shame because I love Doctor Sleep. I thought same. it was great. Yeah, yeah. Warner Brothers has been doing a good job of uh, you know having their horror movies uh, be be hits. Uh, like you said, it movies. Uh, Doctor Sleep was was a big big swing, a little bit of a miss, but you know they tried. And yeah. um, of course, uh, James Wan and his whole like Conjuring universe is all uh, coming out of Definitely. Warner Brothers as well. So they they're doing a good job of keeping their horror brands alive. Yeah. I feel like horror is the brand where you can you can make a name as a director because Mike Flanagan, like regardless, I know Doctor mm -hmm. Sleep wasn't successful, but. Uh, House on Haunted Hill, Hush. Uh, he did. Did he do Oculus as well? Yeah, he did Oculus. So like he's making a, a name for himself, and I think he's got a, another big project coming down the pipe. But um, well, he has the the second part because it's gonna be. Um I forgot what that's called. But anthology. Like, anthology of like Haunting of Hill House. There's another one. Yeah. I forgot what it's called. Um, but yeah, so he's. Yeah, he did on Gerald's that. Game too on Netflix, yeah, that and that's a really great movie. Great. So it's like, and you know, you talk about James Wan and Jordan Peele, and like these, mm -hmm. you attach these directors with horror because I feel it really feel like they can build their own movie. Yeah. And they, I feel like horror directors get so much out of their budget. They mm -hmm. like you know Lee Winnell is going to be up there as well, like mm -hmm. with this small budget Invisible Man, and he he wrote Saw. And yeah. so, yeah. and James Wan directed it. And, mm -hmm. so. and he was in Saw. Yeah, he, he was in the first Saw. So, like, well, that's... You, was, you can tell. <laughs> 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 it's it's so cool, though, um, yeah. to kind of think about that. Like, I do really love Mike Flanagan. The second I started watching Haunting of Hill House, like, it was... I was in right away. Mm -hmm. And um, I had seen Gerald's game before, but I wasn't so familiar with Mike Flanagan. But oh. that's... What that was that title again? Gerald's. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Been watching Thanks, too guys. much of The Witcher. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, but... I decided to say in Witcher. I didn't watch that show yet. I didn't well, watch like, that his either. name is Gerald. Oh, Gerard. Gerald, yeah. Ger Gerald's game. Gerald's okay. game. Gerald's game. Um, so I, I just I, I, like, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I hate you. I have two immigrant parents. I pronounce everything wrong. Mm. But um, Gerald's game and Midsummer. Midsummer. <laughs> no, Midsummer is Midsummer. I'll, I'll die on that hill. Okay, yeah, for sure. I'll uh, Midsummer. I'll die yeah. on that hill. Um, but yeah, no, I really, really do admire Mike Flanagan for everything he did with Doctor Sleep. Um, kind of. I know we did a review on this, but kind of taking, you know, the Stanley Kubrick film, because I had read Dr. Sleep and The Shining, and yep. Stanley Kubrick's The Shining is so different from the book. Mm -hmm. And um, the way in this, he had a huge task. Like, first of all, The Shining is classic. Um, and he had a huge task taking on Stanley Kubrick and kind of like doing like a marriage between Stephen King's book and honoring both. 
And um, yeah. I think he completely successfully did that. And I, yeah, box office wise, I think it could have done better if they pulled a like The Shining 2, Doctor Sleep. Because even like the title, one of my friends thought it was a Marvel superhero. Absolutely. Yeah, she same, yeah. she thought it was, when I was telling her about it, I was like, yeah, I'm going to the Doctor Sleep premiere. She's like, oh, is that like a new Marvel movie? Like you love that stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> no. What are your like, roommates? Yeah, one of my roommates. I'll, I'll guess off air which one it was. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's what, it's such an interesting um, kind of thing to look about be- or look at because um, I'm surprised they took that risk by not putting it in the title. They put in a lot of the marketing, but even these days, like I never really see advertisements too much unless I'm seeking them out myself. Um, like when something comes on before a YouTube video, I literally like turn away and I, I like do something else. Like I do my makeup or whatever and I don't pay attention to it. Um, I don't have cable, so I don't see trailers like on TV. Yeah. Um, so I think if you missed the marketing in that way, you wouldn't know. Yeah, you wouldn't yeah. like know at all. No, and and that's the thing is that like um, it was relying too much on the imagery of the trailer, like yeah. Danny going down the hallway, exactly. room two three seven stuff like that. And you're right though because Stephen King hated Kubrick Shining mm-hmm. so much so that he made his own version and it wasn't as good. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Flanagan had a big job of making Doctor Sleep the sequel of the book to the book The Shining, but you have to make the sequel to The Shining the movie because that's what people know. So how he like handle that masterfully and the performances you and McGregor, uh, Rebecca Ferguson, mm-hmm. uh, so many great performances in that movie. And it's really, I, I'm sure it's going to do fine Jacob on Tremblay. Yeah. Oh God. Jacob his one Tremblay. scene. Yeah. My, oh my, God. my boy. Yeah. God. Was so I was good. like, that why was like... is he in this movie? And then I was like, Oh, that's why <laughs> I've like never been starstruck. RV three was with me. I met Jacob Tremblay for like 30 seconds, maybe a minute. I actually, that was the first time I got like starstruck because I was just like, you're insane. Like the fact that you're such a tiny human, like you're, he's only like 13. He's so little. He's only like 13 and he's so incredibly talented. He completely stole that scene. Um, And I I can't picture somebody else being able to do it better than he did. So that's why I got like starstruck. I was just like in awe. I'm like, dude. Yeah, you're gonna be winning big awards one day. Like he yeah. should have been nominated for Room. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. and also if you want to check out our episode of The Shining, we did an episode of The Shining. Actually. Oh, so we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah episode yeah, of The want. Shining. We have yeah. a Doctor Sleep review. So yeah. you know, it's all part of that. So yeah, definitely <laughs> like check if, that out. If you break down the that scene of Bruce Greenwood, like of him Bruce Greenwood talking to you and McGregor, it's filmed exactly like Jack Nicholson talking to the hotel yeah. manager. Like even like so so much the so to where like the yeah, yeah like the cigarette smoke going down yeah. like the American flag right there it's crazy yeah yeah no it's it, it it's insane yeah now um yeah but yeah i, I think uh dr sleep is just another example of how studios are kind of banking off of uh these these horror properties i think probably the shining's probably the one iconic example of like here's uh a, a elevated horror movie that was kind of ahead of its time it was really more of an art house movie when it first came out mm-hmm. and that kind of transition into like mainstream attention i think now we're seeing movies like the witch and um hereditary are gonna take time and over time they're gonna transition to that like iconic status too so absolutely yeah mm-hmm. um anyway so uh you guys want to talk about any other uh horror movies in particular oh or? wow yeah, <laughs> the, the, the double look over here <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah no yeah. i do have one and i don't know i feel like the cinematography and the score could be elevated horror, mm. but the the story is so pulpy and so like Sam Raimi ish. Yeah. And like Sam Raimi was a great horror director, but he would never be called elevated horror because you know Evil Dead's like so kinetic and crazy. Yeah, and that's yeah. Mandy by uh, Panos Cosmatos with Nicolas Cage. Oh yeah, and. And this is another thing of where, like, the cinematography could be nominated for an Oscar, but the movie that's within it is so batshit crazy. It's so off the walls. Mm -hmm. People are fighting with chainsaws, like, snorting mountains of cocaine off a piece of glass. Like, it's a wild, wild movie, but it's so steeped and soaked and just, like, barrel aged in horror classics and references that I, I can't get enough of it. Right. And uh, if you guys haven't seen Mandy, it's a must watch because yeah. Nicolas Cage, uh, you know, I heard this like on, on Red Letter Media, he does two movies. Mm-hmm. He does Redbox, uh, Netflix uh, to pay his his gambling debts. <laughs> and then he does art house movies where a director will like just kind of let him do him, but mm-hmm. still control him. Mm-hmm. And that's what Mandy is. And he gives an Oscar worthy performance in this movie. It's, so much so that there's a scene in the bathroom where he's just like screaming and you s- think the camera's going to pan in and then like the camera operator like backs up and it's almost as if yeah. he's scared to get too close to Nicolas Cage. <laughs> that is so and it's cool. filmed so, so I I love Mandy. And that could go into like this 
new it's more of like contemplative horror because the first hour of Mandy's very slow before it gets into the whole like revenge aspect of it. Mm. And I mean even movies like like Green Room I, like and that goes back to the I advertising. But like Green Room was like advertised as like this crazy wild like metal band is going to escape Nazis. And really it's like it's real slow. Yeah. Like they're in that room forever and even the action scenes it's like when the guy jumps out the window and he ends up getting stabbed to death immediately. And I was mm. like, wait, did, did that just happen? Because it's so fast and it's not, you know, it's as much as I love John Wick movies, it's not like, oh, they're they're fighting for five minutes with this brilliant choreography. It's no, like, it's just real life. He would just get stabbed to death. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's crazy. No, I um, no, I definitely would like to check out Mandy one of these days. I gotta definitely want to check that one. Yeah, out. I've heard a bunch of good things. So. Yeah, yeah, I love Nicolas Cage and just everything he it's does. So good. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, one that I I, I I always um love and appreciate that nobody else loves, but that's okay. Is uh, the Neon Demon? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, Nicholas yeah. Wonder. I think you, 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 I, uh, I fuck hey, with the Neon yeah, Demon all day. That's what it's about. It's about. <laughs> yeah. That's what it's about. great. To me, that's a great uh, art house horror um, type of movie that deals with a lot of. Uh, themes about you know obviously like models and like fakeness and like la mm -hmm. like kind of culture um kind of coaxed in this like glamorous shiny magazine cover-esque i think that um nicholas i saw a q a with nicholas wanting reffin where he talks about how um the cinematographer and i'm pulling up her name right now uh the cinematographer was natasha uh Brat, uh, Breer and yeah. they she also did Honey Boy yeah she also did Honey Boy oh, as well wow, okay. yeah. Yeah. and um, but sh they said for this film they wanted to get like these um, old 1960s like magazine pho photographer lenses and use that for shooting this movie on like digital so it could have like that classic like magazine cover kind of look um, and you could totally see that all over the film and it kind of adds to the overall theme and like underlying horror like within this within this movie so to me that's one of the best uh one of the best ones i've seen recently made no money nobody seems to like it but i, oh, I definitely appreciate it i i i love me some neon demon i've seen yeah. it like four times and th <laughs> yeah. that movie is messed up but bella bella heathcote and abby lee are amazing supporting like i oh, yeah. like i could nominate them for at least in you know independent spirit if you you don't mm -hmm. not everybody needs to be oscars like just because we've made it the most important award doesn't mean it is yeah, yeah. but it shouldn't be shouldn't no be. but yeah. like um it's i think just people because people just attack attach their expectations to so many things and mm -hmm. after drive people like if you didn't think it was going to be a fast and furious movie there is Quite a bit of action in there. Like, it's real yeah. violent. It's real accessible. Ryan Gosling's great in it. Yeah. Ryan Cranston's in there. And then, you know, he comes out with Only God Forgives. And that that is a very divisive movie. And I'm okay with that being divisive because it's real slow. But then it suddenly gets, like, super gruesomely violent. But the colors are still there. And, like, that color palette follows over to Neon mm -hmm. Demon. And I love the score. Like, I literally work out to the song that they hear the, at the nightclub. Yeah. Because like, that yeah. song... Goes that was hard. Like what talking about, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I'm. I I I haven't checked out his. I know he did that Amazon series with, with Miles Teller, Nicholas Winning Ref, and uh, Too Old to Die Young. Oh, uh, I haven't seen that one. Yet. Yeah, I haven't either. I, I I haven't heard great things, but I mean, I'm okay with that because no one likes any of his movies besides Drive. Yeah. Like, if you guys yeah. haven't seen Valhalla Rising, that was before or. Uh, what was the Tom Hardy Bronson. one? Bronson with, yeah. with Tom Hardy. Yeah, Bronson is my shit, too. Yeah, he makes these real, quiet, introspective movies about things that you think would be this boisterous, bloody action movie. Like, mm -hmm. Bronson is about a, the, one of the most uh, criminalized persons in London who, like, would start riots yeah. and fights with the guards every single day, and somehow he makes it, like, this introspective character piece. Mm -hmm. like, I love mm -hmm. it. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I totally agree. I think everything that he does, even even Drive, I think is definitely his most accessible film. I think that's why people love it so much. But I definitely recommend if you haven't watched The Neon Demon, you should definitely check that one out. Yeah, so again, my one that I want to highlight is Ari Aster. I can't get enough of it. I don't know if you guys are familiar with a short film he did um, mm. years ago. It's called like uh, The Strange Things of about the Johnsons. Oh, okay. I didn't Have know you that. seen that? No, I haven't seen that. No. Oh. Look at all of us trying to outdo each other. Yeah, like yeah. Our small short films. films well, and shit. <laughs> yeah. No, it was one he did. I don't know if you saw though. this, like a uh, drawing uh, on a napkin he did. <laughs> but uh, I mean, uh, not a lot of people know about it. I got a napkin. But no, because I remember because I was uh, I was huge on Tumblr <laughs> at the time. Like I was always on Tumblr, and so I would just find all these random like 
you know, short films, songs, mm-hmm. things like that. And some of them kind of just like stuck with me and I thought about them for a long time. And one of them. The strange thing about the. <gasps> oh my yes! God, he did that movie? Yes. Oh shit. Google it. Oh my maybe God. You, maybe you heard I know exactly it. what Yo! you're talking about now. What's it called? Yeah, the, the strange thing, thing about, about the Johnson. Johnson. This is one of the most fucked up movies That's I've what I'm ever saying. seen in my entire life. It stuck with me. I had no idea when I was going to see Hereditary. I didn't know till right after I saw Hereditary that he did that. It is. Bro, there's no fucking up. way. Like, holy shit. It is shit. messed up. And that's literally why I can't get enough of Ari Aster. I'm just like, bro, get therapy. Like, this is insane. It's like 30 minutes long? Yeah. All right, I'll watch it again. So. It's I think so, up. but it is seriously, it's messed up. Well, it's but like, it's different. It's different where it's not yeah. horror. It's just, it's very, very scary. That's, this, this is that's way disturbing. More yeah, that's, it's, it's very, very disturbing. It's supposed to be funny, but it's fucked up. Like, okay. Is this okay. supposed to be funny? Some people, I mean, the the way I was there's introduced so, to it was a podcast really? laughing at it. Like, well, because yeah. obviously the way, obviously I don't want to talk about anything. Go check it out. If you haven't seen this short film, please go check people it out. Are it people is, are going to know what this is like the second they Google second, it. Like, because I remember I, watching it on Tumblr having no idea and then finishing it and being like, that was entirely messed up. And then all of a sudden I... I'm introduced years later, like years later to Hereditary. And then I'm looking him up and I see that. And I was like, no way. And then so him just coming out with these films that are so, so bizarre, so insane. Like the themes, like especially that one, that one is where you could look at it. It, that's kind of bad to look at it as like a comedy. I feel like even yeah, if, well, it's like a fucked up. Like it's messed up. It's one of those well, like yeah, you got you got pictures like this, like <laughs> like that about uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Nah, and when you watch the movie, you'll know why. Like okay. yeah, yeah. It <laughs> it's something that's interesting. But that's why Ari Aster is the one. I cannot believe you didn't know that. I nah. mentioned it when we talked about. Like top I didn't directors. look up the title. I didn't look up yeah. the title. That's why. Like, but that's oh, so damn. funny. I feel like a lot of people, um, like in our generation, know about it because it went viral. Like it did go viral. Um, during that time, I remember seeing it on Twitter, Tumblr, all of that. Um, this but is yeah. from 2011. Yeah. yeah, but I okay. think people people started like memeing it I like 2017, 2018. No, I saw it when it like first came out. Yeah, because it went viral on Tumblr and. People were talking about it everywhere, and I was just like, okay, let me check this thing out. And I remember feeling so gross afterwards. I was like, oh, yeah, God. It's, it's like a David F. Sandberg uh, went viral for his his horror, the, but like, and then he made Lights Out, which is like basically the longer version of his yeah, YouTube video. Yeah, exactly. It's so interesting how that happens. I feel like that's a really cool, interesting way to find these filmmakers because – him being at the time like not a household name, uh, he's still like not like a household name, but like a lot of people, mm-hmm. a lot more people know about him now. But then just coming out with that and like breaking the internet, like I remember people going crazy about it. And still, I'll see on Twitter every so often, there'll be like a screenshot and people will say like, "You haven't felt like odd until you've seen this movie." Like this movie will, br- or if you've seen the short film, you know, and it'll just be like the picture of it. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So that's why Ari Aster, he's still my favorite. I. Gosh, I look forward to everything. Same thing with Robert Eggers because I did love The Lighthouse so much. Mm-hmm. There's so, so much to love about it. Um, and I do, as pretentious as it is to talk about like elevated horror and art house horror, I love all horror. But this just, this affects me physically and like emotionally so much more. I feel like when mm-hmm. when being grounded with these themes, um, stay tuned for a the invisible man review that i'll be doing and that'll yeah. be posted once the embargo lifts um mm-hmm. i really really wish i could have talked about it today because i could talk about it for an hour um but yeah so that's some of the stuff that's why that's why i want to talk about it this week mm. it, it all it's yeah exciting. i think it was a fun topic i had a, i had a lot of fun yeah, yeah absolutely this is the the kind of horror that i like talking about because i'm yeah. i'm not a big fan you know looking out like a, at a like Blumhouse's list, you know, they've got <laughs> Lords of Salem and The Purge and... Mm-hmm. Uh, Purge I fuck with, but... Oh, no. <laughs> it's a cool, I think it's a cool idea. It's a cool idea, for sure. Purge and I hear the, the the TV show is good, and I, I, I get I get what they're going for with the political stuff, but they're just beating you over the head with it when, yeah. like, Purge 3 is about two presidential Election campaigns day, yeah. and it's, like, one blonde lady with glasses and another mm-hmm. guy that's, like, got orange skin. And I was like, oh, what are y'all talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you always want a little bit of that, like, subtlety. Like, if you are trying to make a statement, kind of, like, do it in a more profound way with the statement, not so much with all the visuals, like an orange man. Or their uh, their Facebook horror movie, Unfriended. (laughs) Unfriended. I didn't mind Unfriended, actually. I didn't mind that movie. Yeah. I mean, did anybody see it? Yeah. It's it's not that bad. I saw it. They had another one uh, with John Chu that was, like, the same concept. That's Uh, great. Searching searching. is amazing. Searching is pretty good, too. 
Um, they also have an episode of Modern Family that that did that style as well. I'm so. fine with the style, but like I saw, I've seen parts of Unfriended or the the new one, Dark Web or whatever it was no, called. I seen Dark Web. Oh. I saw uh, Dark Web so much worse. Just really? skip that yeah, one. Yeah. 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 Like yeah. truth or dare stuff like that, but I mean, <laughs> see, I watched that one. No, me and my ex boyfriend went to the movies to go see that, and we just got like hammered, and we enjoyed it so much. Mm-hmm. Well, like when they because put that, that Snapchat filter, like, yeah, I, were they trying to be unreal. scared? Were they like just yeah. being self aware and be like, this movie's ridiculous? Let's I, just do it. Yeah, I just saw it that one time, and I was like completely inebriated. But there's <laughs> there's certain parts that are just so entertaining, so I I applaud it for that. Like they make it on no budget, Lucy Hale. Is yeah. always down to star in it, I guess. She's mm. in Truth or Dare, and she's in the new one, like Fantasy Island, that just came out. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. somebody book Lucy Hale. <laughs> so it, she can stop book. doing these. Sure. Um, but also, like, I don't know if you guys seen, like, The Gallows. That one I came haven't. out forever ago. Um, it's not good. Okay. But it's another one where it's, like, in theater, like, entertaining, go with your friends type of thing. So I, I mean, think they just kill it with that kind of stuff. Yeah, my, yeah. my, my go-to every year is Freddy vs. Jason. Like really, that's it's just so campy. Like yeah, uh, Robert England is just living his best life yeah. in that in that plaid sweater. So, and you love it. Like you know, Kelly Rowland <laughs> gets brutally murdered in that yeah. when she's like talking talking mess to Robert England. It's, yeah, and it's hilarious. And you know, you have. Uh, like ninety, like slash two thousands, like alt rock playing, like let the bodies hit the floor. Yeah. It's like <laughs> yeah. it's just like right up my alley. It's great. And then so I, I can combine that with hereditary, with the mm-hmm. thing, with it comes at night and stuff like that. So you'll get a little bit of both. Yeah, no, that's actually funny because um you said you weren't a horror person, so I wanted to ask you kind of like if you liked like the Halloween franchises, if you like like the Exorcist, kind of like I like Halloween. I like yeah. the Ex- Exorcist. Everything and I appreciate what Halloween was originally trying to do yeah. make itself an anthology film like Trick or Treat, like mm-hmm. where it doesn't have to involve Michael Myers. Like, because yeah. I'm such a, a Carpenter stan, like, I'll watch anything he does forever and ever. And his scores are some of the best in history. Uh, but I didn't like the Rob Zombie because I at least respected the first half of Rob Zombie because he was making his own film, even though it was. Dirty and disgusting and pointless. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But then the yeah. second half of the movie is just a remake of Halloween, like a shot for shot remake almost. Yeah. And then Halloween 2 is just ridiculous, even though I appreciated how huge they made Michael Myers. Like he's just this unstoppable force. But then the the new one, the, the H2O2, basically, where they. With Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah. Like the one that's just. Just recently. came out okay. and where they're making a sequel this year it was yeah. terrible. It really? Was, it I liked it. I, I know. Oh, I the know. new the new Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah. yeah, I thought it was pretty good. I it was. <laughs> you have forty <laughs> years. You have forty years <laughs> to prepare for this, and all you do is get a twenty two caliber rifle and some blocks on your doors. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, that's it. That's all she did. Yeah. The thing is, my favorite part, and I don't know if you ended up watching Halloween Res- Resurrection. I I uh, oh, yeah, recommended, you recommended it to you. From, yeah. The part with Buster Rhymes. Oh, that's yeah. great. I. Love that so much. Like I love all that ridiculous Happy stuff. Happy Halloween, motherfucker! Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. So so good, but yeah, because like I don't know, like growing up with horror, like I watched a little bit of everything, and like some of the stuff I compared to what we're talking about with elevated horror would be like the first first Texas Chainsaw Massacre, um, The Shining, like all of that kind of stuff. Even oh my god, I'm losing my train of thought. What is the uh, Poltergeist? Like guys, those, yeah. those are all like examples from like older ones because this isn't a brand new type of film. I just feel like it's getting kind of more recognition now. Like more, I don't know, like more films are coming out that are sort of like in that vein and don't have a lot of like studio interference that are making it like, oh, mm-hmm. put all these jump scares, let's put a crap ton of money, all that kind of stuff. So that's why that's why I really like this genre. Right, right, yeah. right. hundred percent. No, that, yeah. Uh, I think it's awesome that we're seeing like this new revelation in the horror. Absolutely. I think that uh, hopefully we can c- continue to see the horror genre grow and and uh, for I guess continue to evolve into seeing more of these ma- these more smaller directors have a mainstream platform like Jordan Peele or like James Wan. So yeah, yeah. even even like David Robert Mitchell with um with uh, It Follows. Oh yeah, and yeah. Then, it follows. We didn't yeah, talk about that one. That's follows. a good one. So mm. so good. I don't yeah. know if you guys saw. Under the Silver I you I know you saw it. Under yeah. the Silver Lake. It's been on my Amazon watch list forever. I need to get around to it. It is one of my well, it's definitely it was in my top five of last year. But okay. um it's so so good. It's really weird though. But that's something where like I thought he brought some elements from it follows, some kind of like 
little like thriller horror elements into kind of like a noir. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I thought that's interesting. And I love having these like new refreshing voices. Um, yeah. you know, and that's a two, four. Even, yeah. um, exactly. Even, um, even, um, I forget the name of the dude who created, um, who created euphoria, but his first movie assassination nation, yeah. uh, is also, oh, that was on Hulu for a while. I missed that one too. Yeah. Yeah. That's from the, and the, yeah, I watched 376 <laughs> last year. So that is ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. yeah but assassination <laughs> nation is definitely like, it's, I guess it's more of a thriller type thing, yeah. but yeah, that definitely is one of those ones that I, I, I appreciate as well. So yeah, yeah, definitely. cool. So thank you for, uh, listening to the meeting up podcast. Um, Thank you so much, Bingata, for joining us. Thank yeah, you for having me, guys. Thanks, ben. Subscribe to the Meeting of Podcast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there we yeah. go. Yeah. Um, no, you have your own separate channel too, though. I do. Uh, Bingata Movie Reviews, and then I stream uh, daily, like four times a week, uh, twitch.tv slash uh, The Ben Goddard. Yeah, where can people find you on Twitter and Instagram? Uh, the Ben Goddard. All my socials at The Ben Goddard. There we go. And you can follow yeah. me, Sabrina X Monica, on Twitter and Instagram. Yeah, follow me at Director RB3. And then you can follow the First Cut account. First yeah. cut TMO on both Twitter and Instagram. Make sure you like this video and subscribe. So for the meeting of this week, we're peacing out. So.